Purgatory, Chapter 38, Matter of Expiation, Failure in Matters of Justice. A multitude of revelations show us that God chastises with implacable rigor all sins contrary to justice and charity, and in matters of justice he seems to exact that reparation be made before the penalty is remitted. As in the church militant, her ministers must enact restitution in order to remit the guilt, according to the axiom, without restitution, no remission. Father P. Rossignoli speaks of a religious of his order named Augustine de Espinoza, whose saintly life was but one act of devotion to the souls in purgatory. A rich man who went to him to confession having died without having sufficiently regulated his fares, appeared to him and asked him first if he knew him. Certainly, replied the father, I administered the sacrament of penance to you a few days before your death. You must know then, added the soul, that I come to you by a special grace of God to conjure you to appease his justice and to do for me that which I can no longer do for myself. Follow me. The father first went to see his superior to tell him what was asked of him, and to obtain permission to follow the strange visitor. The permission obtained, he went out and followed the apparition, who, without uttering a single word, led him to one of the bridges of the city. There begged the father to wait a little, disappeared for a moment, then returned with a bag of money which it begged the father to carry, and both returned to the cell of the religious. Then the deceased gave him a written note, and showed him the money. All this, he said, is at your disposal. Have the charity to take it, that you may satisfy my creditors, whose names are written upon this paper, with the amount due to each. Be pleased to take what remains and use it for the good works at your own discretion for the repose of my soul. With these words he disappeared, and the father hastened to carry out his wishes. Eight days had scarcely elapsed when Father de Espinosa received another visit from the same soul. He thanked the father most heartily. Thanks to the charitable exactitude, he said, with which you have paid the debts that I left on earth. Thanks also to the holy masses which you have celebrated for me, I am delivered from all my sufferings and am admitted into eternal beatitude. We find an example of the same kind of the life of the blessed Margaret of Cortona. This illustrious penitent also distinguished herself by her charity toward the departed souls. They appeared to her in great numbers to implore her assistance in suffrages. One day, among others, she saw before her two travelers, who begged her to assist them in repairing the injuries left to their account. We are two merchants, they told her, who have been assassinated on the road by brigands. We could not go to confession nor receive absolution, but by the mercy of our divine Savior and his Holy Mother, we had the time to make an act of perfect contrition, and we have been saved. But our torments in purgatory are terrible, because in the exercise of our profession we have committed many acts of injustice. Until these acts are repaid, we can have no repose nor alleviation. This is why we beseech you, servant of God, to go and find such and such of our relatives and heirs, to warn them to make restitution as soon as possible of all the money which we have unjustly acquired. They gave the holy penitent the necessary information, and then disappeared. Purgatory, Chapter 39, Matter of Expiation, Sins Against Charity We have already said that divine justice is extremely severe in regards to sin against charity. Charity is, in fact, the virtue which is dearest to the heart of our Divine Master, in which he recommends to his disciples, as that which must distinguish them from the eyes of men. By this, he says, 
shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13:35. It is then not astonishing that harshness towards our neighbor and every other fault against charity should be severely punished in the other life. Of this we have several proofs, taken from the life of the blessed Margaret Mary. I learned from Sister Margaret, says Mother Gauthier in her memoirs, that she one day prayed for two persons of high rank in the world who had just died. She saw them both in purgatory. The one was condemned for several years for those sufferings, notwithstanding the great number of masses which were celebrated for her. All those prayers and suffrages were by divine justice applied to the souls belonging to some of the families of her subjects, which had been ruined by their injustice and lack of charity. As nothing was left to those poor people to enable them to have prayers offered for them after their death, God compensated these poor people in the manner we have related. The other was in purgatory for many days, as she had lived years upon the earth. Our Lord made known to Sister Margaret that among the good works which this person had performed, he had taken into special consideration the charity with which she had borne the faults of her neighbor and the pains she had taken to overcome the displeasure they have caused her. On another occasion our Lord showed a blessed Margaret a large number of souls in purgatory who, for not having been united with their superiors during this life, and for having some misunderstanding between them, have been severely punished and deprived after death the aid of the Blessed Virgin and the saints, and also of the visits of their guardian angels. Several of those were souls destined to remain a long time in horrible flames. Some, even among them, had no other token of their predestination other than that they did not hate God. Others, who had been in religion, and who during the life showed little charity towards their sisters, were deprived of their sufferings, and received no assistance whatsoever. Let us add one more extract from the memoirs of Mother Griffier. It happened while Sister Margaret was praying for two deceased religious, who their souls were shown to her in the prisons of divine justice, but one suffered incomparably more than the other. The former regretted greatly that her faults against mutual charity and the holy friendship that ought to remain in religious communities, she had in part deprived herself, among other punishments, of the suffrages which were offered for her by the community. She received the relief only from the prayers of three or four persons of the same community for whom she had less affection and inclination during her life. This suffering soul reproached herself also for the too great facility with which she took dispensations from the rules and exercises of the community. Finally, she deplored the care which she had taken upon earth to procure for her body so many comforts and commodities. She made known at the same time to our dear sister that, in punishment for three faults, she had to undergo three furious assaults of the demon during her last agony, and that each time believing herself lost, she was on the point of falling into despair. But by the Blessed Virgin, towards whom she had borne a great devotion during her life, she had been snatched three times from the claws of the enemy. Purgatory Chapter 40 Matter of Expiation lack of charity and of respect towards our neighbor. True charity is humble and indulgent towards others, respecting them as though they were their superiors. Her words are always friendly and full of consideration for others, having nothing of bitterness nor coldness, nothing savoring of contempt, because she is born of a heart that is meek and humble like that of Jesus. She also carefully avoids all that could disturb unity. She takes every means, makes every sacrifice to effect a reconciliation, according to the words of our Divine Master. If thou offer thy gift at the altar, 
and there thou remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, leave there thy offering before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then coming thou shalt offer thy gift. Matthew 5.23 A religious having wounded charity in regards to St. Louis Bertrand received a terrible chastisement after death. He was plunged into the fires of purgatory, which he had to endure until he had made satisfaction to divine justice. Nay more could he not be admitted into the abode of the elect, until he had accomplished an act of exterior reparation, which would serve as an example to the living. The fact is thus related in the life of the saint. When St. Louis Bertrand, in the order of St. Dominic, resided at the convent of Valencia, there was two young religious in the community who attached too much importance to the profane science. Doubtless letters and erudiums have their value, but as the Holy Ghost declares, they should yield to the fear of God and the science of the saints. There is none above him that feareth the Lord. This science of the saints, which eternal wisdom came to teach us, consists humility and charity. The young religious of whom we speak while but little advanced in divine science, allowed himself to reproach Father Bertrand with his little knowledge and said to him, One can see, Father, that you are not very learned. Brother, replied the saint with meek firmness, Lucifer was very learned, and yet he was damned. The brother who had committed this fault did not think of repairing it. Nevertheless, he was not a bad religious, and some time after, falling dangerously sick, he received the last sacraments in very good dispositions, and expired peaceably in the Lord. In considerable time passed, and meanwhile Lewis was nominated prior. One day, having remained in choir after matins, the deceased appeared to him enveloped in flames, and prostrating humbly before him, said, Father, pardon me for the offensive words I have formally addressed to you. God will not permit me to see his face until you shall have pardoned my fault and offered holy mass for me. The saint willingly forgave him, and the next morning celebrated mass for the repose of his soul. The following night, being again in choir, he saw the deceased brother reappear, but radiant with joy in going up to heaven. Father Esibus Nirenberg, religious of the Company of Jesus, author of the beautiful book, Difference Between Time and Eternity, resided at the College of Madrid, where he died in the odor of sanctity in 1658. This servant of God, who was singularly devout towards the souls in purgatory, was praying one day in the church of the college for a father who had recently died. The deceased, who for a long time had been a professor of theology, had proved himself to be as good as a religious as he was learned a theologian. He had been distinguished for his great devotion to the Blessed Virgin, but one vice had crept in among his virtues. He was uncharitable in his words and frequently spoke of the faults of his neighbor. Now whilst Father Nuremberg was recommending his soul to God, this religious appeared and revealed to him the state of his soul. He was condemned to frightful torments for having frequently spoken against charity. His tongue, the instruments of his fault, was tortured by a devouring fire. The Blessed Virgin, in recompense for the tender devotion which he had cherished towards her, had obtained permission for him to come and ask for prayers. He was, at the same time, to serve an example to others, that they might learn to be guarded in their words. Father Nuremberg, having offered many prayers and penances for him, finally obtained his deliverance. The religious of whom mention is made in the life of Blessed Margaret Mary, and whom that servant of God suffered so terribly for the space of three months, among other faults, was also punished for this sins against charity. The revelation is thus related. Blessed Margaret Mary, we read in her life, 
being one day before the Blessed Sacrament, suddenly saw before a man totally enveloped in fire, the intense heat of which seemed to consume herself. The wretched state in which she saw this poor soul caused her to shed tears. He was a Benedictine religious of the monastery of Kelney, to whom she had formerly confessed, and who had done good to her soul by ordering her to receive Holy Communion. In reward for this service, God had permitted him to address himself to her, that he might find some alleviation in his sufferings. The poor departed asked that all she should do and suffer for the space of three months might be applied to him. This she promised after having obtained permission. Then he told her that the principal cause of his intense suffering was for having sought his own interests before the glory of God and for the good of souls, by attaching too much importance to his reputation. The second was want of charity towards his brethren. The third, the natural affection of creatures to whom, through weakness, he had yielded, and to which he had given expression in his spiritual intercourse with them, this being, he added, very displeasing to God. It is difficult to say all that the Blessed Sister had to suffer during these three months following. The deceased never left her. On the side where he stood, she seemed all on fire, with such excruciating pain that she could not cease to weep. Her superior, touched with compassion, ordered her penances and disciplines, because pain and suffering greatly relieved her. These torments which the sanctity of God inflicted upon her, were insupportable. It was a specimen of the sufferings endured by the poor souls.